Uh, this is a Ford Model T, basically, which the Ford Motor Company adapted as an ambulance in World War I and shipped thousands of them over as a chassis, which then put together with wooden bodies over it. That, that over the there. Yeah. And the, um, each division of the American Expeditionary Force was considered sort of an independent little army of its own with about 25,000 men in it. So each one had four regiments of infantry, they had artillery, and then they had four ambulance companies to serve the sort of sanitary needs of the, yep. the, um, the division. And the, the ambulance companies, as well as the field hospitals, were all organized as what was called the sanitary train of the unit. Um, but they were generally uh, assigned either to a specific regiment or to the brigade in which the regiments were divided up. So uh, in Connecticut, there was an ambulance company raised in Bridgeport, which was really uh, became the 102nd ambulance company. Okay. And it served mainly sort of in association with the 102nd Infantry, which was a Connecticut raised infantry unit of the Yankee Division, of the 26th Division. And each of the ambulance companies had about 12 ambulances, so there would be about 48 ambulances in the whole unit, of the whole division. Were they, they mainly just for transporting wounded soldiers, or there they, couldn't have been too much care going on in the back? Not too much you know? care. Uh, there was very basic field care at the aid stations, which were the closest um, kind of medical treatment facilities just behind the battle lines. So if you had a wound, you would be dressed there. In fact, the medic or the stretcher bearers who brought you in from the field might have already put a dressing on you to staunch the bleeding, but you would then be slightly stabilized at the aid station and then carried either by stretcher or by ambulance down to a dressing station operated by the ambulance company itself. The officers of the company were medical doctors from home, so mm -hmm. they had basic um, medical facility. Uh, they wouldn't do any serious surgery, but they could right. definitely stabilize. They would generally give everybody a tetanus shot <laughs> because there was tetanus in the soil over there. So they knew that back so then. They knew that. So yeah. that was almost routine that you would get a tetanus shot. Uh, and normally if you got a tetanus shot, they would use iodine to put a T on your forehead. So down the line, everybody knew that you had been treated for tetanus. Okay. A little bottle of ammonia. What is this again now? You're... This is the what was issued to all medical personnel. Okay. Which is a belt with dressings of various forms. Um, I have, I think I mentioned the wound tags that were applied. This was a little book that, uh, called Diagnosis Tags. So somewhere between the medic who first, or the stretcher bearer who first picked you up on the battlefield and probably the dressing station operated by the ambulance company, someone would fill out this little tag that listed your name, your number, and a diagnosis. So you might, it might say GSW for gunshot wound or gas, and then they would know what treatments were done initially, and then somebody would sign it, and this would be wired to one of your buttons so it would go with you down the line. From the dressing station, they would then be loaded again into ambulances and sent generally to a field hospital. And the tent over there represents the field hospital, which would be just gonna maybe just on the ver range of artillery. So it was a, a few miles behind the, the dressing station, which was generally still within the, the battle zone. Depending on whether you were in sort of stationary situation, fighting in trenches, then the field hospitals would have a fairly um, permanent sta station a, a relatively short distance behind the mm -hmm. lines. If, as in the last uh, campaign of the war, that use Argonne, where they were driving the Germans back, the field hospitals would have to keep moving to keep up with the troops. Um, so tentage was a, a very um, useful way of yeah, doing that. Just otherwise, the field work. hospital might be in a building in a, in a town uh, that had not been um, badly damaged, um, but in a field hospital. This is a standard kit for a doctor, um, sort of a frontline doctor who might be uh, serving in a field hospital. And brain surgery actually um, got a big lift through World War I because of there were so many head wounds. And Harvey Cushing, the, what kind of the 
the father of American neurosurgery, was a, a doctor over there, went over the Harvard I didn't unit, know that. and he wow. traveled around to the field hospitals to assess what was going on and learned a lot of, or developed some techniques based on the, the needs of the time. Wow. So um, it did contribute quite a bit to surgical techniques just out of pure need. From the field hospital, which serves as sort of a triage unit, you would be divided up depending on your wound and then taken again by ambulance to uh, evacuation hospitals or other more permanent hospitals in the rear for treatment. And one of the major issues, especially as the war progressed, was the use of poison gas. So I have my gas mask on here, mm -hmm. uh, which I would sometimes have to drive wearing. There were accounts of... The, the, that must have just been crazy. I don't yeah, know how and, they did uh, it. When the mask fogged up, there were accounts of some drivers just and don't get me wrong, listen, pulling it down, keeping the breathing through the yep. uh, you know, but you driving know, with uh, bare eyes and accumulating gas you in their faces. Oh, but, but that was the only way they could see their way down yeah. the road. And these, they're going through. Um, well, they could go off road a bit because these ambulances were quite tough. But generally, they were trying to drive on roads, but they were generally shell popped as well. So they maneuvering around shell holes or kind of through shell holes and taking a lot of beating. Not, not a comfortable Driving ride, and night, not a comfortable uh, ride at all, I would No, think and that. at night you would have to drive with the headlights out because you didn't want to attract artillery or um, <laughs> bombs. So you were kind of feeling your way through the countryside. Normally an ambulance was staffed by a driver and an orderly who was his assistant who kind of kept an eye on the wounded in the back and um, also helped him navigate. Could take over if necessary, but um, so it was basically a two-person operation. Yep. And the gas, which I was starting to mention, would be treated initially at the, well, all the soldiers wore gas masks, but they might have inhaled some of the either chlorine or phosgene gas, which was irritating their lungs. But the worst was the mustard gas, which was introduced in 1917 and was a, um, they call it a vesicant, so it burned your skin badly and it would be absorbed in your uniform and so it could burn through your uniform. So I have a, um, a copper tank there which is actually a French um, agricultural sprayer but they adapted them to fill with uh, a solution of water and bicarbonate of soda to neutralize the gas oh, so you would commonly get yeah. sprayed down when you were brought to the dressing station and then your uniform would be stripped off and you'd get a new uniform. Yeah to uh, prevent any further burns. But um, the one thing they didn't, I think I mentioned the tetanus, um, the thing that they, they did have anesthesia for surgery and uh, they did have morphine, which might be administered even at, at the front, very front line, but they did not have um, uh, antibiotics. So there were a lot of potential issues down the line and one being gas gangrene, which was um, anaerobic, um, gangrene, which could be, again, very right, lethal. Right. Um, but all in all, the medical care was pretty high level for the time. I think would think for the time. Yeah. I mean, it had probably made a huge advancement, advancement since the Civil War. Oh, definitely, know. definitely so, yes. And they were doing blood typing, blood transfusions, and um, so if you survived the trip from the field <laughs> and were not lethally wounded through a major organ, like a lung or something, you had a pretty good chance of surviving, perhaps debilitated, especially with gas wounds. Mm -hmm. um, lung, uh, lung scarring could maybe never be healed, but, uh, but all in all, the, the level of care, the, the attention that they paid to the care to begin with, and then the actual medical care, I think was pretty remarkable. You know, nobody was tracking how many women actually went to France. Mm. But I think there's probably more than we recognize. Um, my One of my favorites are these ladies here. Uh, they are the Hello Girls. They were bilingual switchboard operators. Mm. And a group of them trained in Hartford. Um, I think only one or two of these women ended up going to France um, and they were stationed with the YMCA. But a lot of the women that trained in other places were on the front lines. 
and they had to be bilingual because they were relaying orders at the highest levels between the French and American armies. Uh, you know, and the Salvation Army, which is the dress that I'm wearing, were on the front lines. Uh, and one of my favorite stories is Myrtle Turkington, who was from Manchester, Connecticut, and she served on the front lines with the Salvation Army. And she was attached to the Yankee Division, which is what these guys have, the, the, and those were the New England National Guard troops. And so she was about three miles behind the front line. The Salvation Army provided comfort. They made donuts and hot cocoa, and uh, they helped them write letters. They sang with them because everyone sang during World War I. It was just what people did. And, you know, they made pies and cookies and provided that spiritual support uh, for the troops. She was being shelled, shells were falling around her, but she stayed at her post and continued to care for the wounded that were being brought in. Uh, so this is an incredibly rare look at a woman, a woman's experience in combat, because this was the closest women got to the front lines. And, I mean, she was on the front lines. She wasn't behind them. She was 